Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, and thanks to Vermont Studio Center for inviting me back. Um, it's great to be back here. I get to experience it in the snow. Last time I was here was like August, so it feels really different. Um, so uh, I'm basically just going to sort of talk about some different areas of my work and sort of take you through the trajectory of my work. Um, I sort of probably have too many images, so I might talk a little bit quickly. But um, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to interject because it makes it more exciting for me um, or at the end, whichever you prefer. But um, anyway, I, I thought this would be a good image to start with. Um, I went to grad school at Pratt and um, once I graduated, I didn't have a studio or a dark room. And so I began um, kind of building sculptures and making sets and then photographing them and started using myself in those photographs as a way to kind of create a studio inside a, a camera. And then I could take apart everything and I would have like a, a photo documentation of this mini performance uh, that I had enacted. And after a while, I wanted to work with multiple people, but I sort of, I liked curating this world and um, having complete control over it. And so bringing in somebody else felt like a collaboration that I was unwilling to partake in. So I began using myself um, as multiple players in the same photograph. So this is one of the earliest ones that I had done. It's called Last Supper. Um, and a lot of these early photos kind of depict uh, identical figures dressed in a kind of uniform manner um, in, against some sort of either institutional environment or kind of a chaotic natural environment. Um, and the uniformity for me um, is something that continues throughout the work. Um, it Literally there's a, a uniform but in uh, some ways I like the fact that it kind of creates this um, homogenous unit that within that you, you have this sort of seemingly uh, homogeneous kind of grouping, but then within that you'll see people asserting their own individuality and acting out against that notion. Uh, within this body of work, I was also really interested in the idea of uh, portraying adolescence and in particular boyhood. Um, I've always been interested in these transitional states. So, um, Adolescence seems like almost the, the apex of that in a way where it's almost like a pupate state. You're, not, uh, you're neither a, a child or an adult. And as I was growing up, I always had looked a lot younger than I actually was. And so I kind of would play that to my advantage sometimes. And there was something that I noticed as I got older that it seemed that there were sort of uh, rites of passage or seeming rites of passage for women or certain cultures, but not necessarily um, Western rites of passages for men uh, as a threshold into adulthood. So for instance, I remember being in school in sex ed and they would talk about the maturation process and when a woman's getting her first menstrual cycle, that means that she's becoming a woman. And I remember thinking at the time, well, what is it for a boy? Like, how do you know when a boy is becoming a man? And I was waiting and there was never any sort of definitive answer. And as I got older, I would ask my friends and the answers always varied uh, drastically from like when they could drive or when they could drink or vote or shave or have sex or, um, and so it seemed very nebulous. And so um, this image kind of talks about that almost directly. It's this figure in the foreground under a sort of almost Bernini-esque, um, outdoor shower that looks like rays of light. And in the background, the, the figure in the red hood has a stigmata um, that's being bandaged by uh, tampons and maxi pads. Um, and the piece is called stigmata. And so it sort of references uh, that idea of um, these sort of rites of passage. Also, I think you'll notice from the titles of the works, there's a huge sort of um, Catholic background to them and I was a Sunday school dropout and so most of what I learned about religion came from when I was studying art history um, and I liked the allegorical aspect of it and I think somehow that uh, storytelling portion of it got mixed up when I was growing up with stories that I had gleaned from my family. Um, my entire family's Cuban, 
So we would get these kind of fairy tales and nursery rhymes and stuff that were of uh, Cuban descent mixed in with American um, cultural items and then also these kind of religious stories. And somehow, to me, they all melded together into these hybridized um, fictions. And I began to explore that in my work as well. Um, I'll just flip through some of this. This is uh, Morning After. This one is called Blizzard. Um, one of the things I also strive in my work still um, is to kind of create a further in-between state in the sense that they're ambiguous. Um, they appear almost like snapshots from the middle of a longer narrative, and it's difficult to tell necessarily what's going on, who's the victim, who's the victimizer. Uh, and so, for example, in this image, um, whether the figure in the foreground is being held in a protective embrace or if he's been caught and he's in some sort of headlock, whether the figures on the fence are breaking into an area or escaping from an area, um, that kind of thing where um, every time you, the viewer comes back to the work, they can interpret it differently, is something that I've always enjoyed in other people's work and um, try to strive for within my own. Um, and as this body of work progressed, um, I became less interested in the idea of coming of age, suburban stories, and more um, interested in, I guess, touching on historical events. So um, this image is called Pile, and it kind of references the Catholic Church's role uh, in uh, almost ignoring the Holocaust and um, the idea of excommunication for people who are LGBT, and just uh, basically a lot of issues within the Catholic Church that um, are problematic. Um, but at the same time, it has a playful side to it that references certain um, school uh, schoolyard kind of activities. Um, this image is called Cannibals. Uh, again, there's no differentiation between victim and victimizer, and um, so that sort of kind of creates that ambiguity. Um, part of this work is, is from a series called the Detention Series, which um, the word itself sort of has a connotation of after-school punishment, but at the same time refers to detention camps and labor camps. So this Im image is called Window Washers, uh, and you can sort of see in the dark sweater of the figure all the way over on the right-hand side, uh, the reflection of somebody on the other side with their tongue, and they're basically cleaning the window with their tongues. Um, and within this work is this idea of labor and these almost Sisyphean tasks. So you see that again here um, in this image where figures are carting snow either away from this site or to the site. Um, and as I was working in this um, sort of body of work, um, I was interested in the idea of multiplicity, which you'll see again in my work throughout um, this presentation. Um, and so here, this is kind of like, I guess, um, the apex of that in the sense that there's about 42 uh, figures charging towards the viewer, and they're all identical, and they're sort of charging en masse. And the actual photograph um, is about 24 feet long and wraps around the wall. Um, and at this time, I was really interested in kind of breaking outside of the traditional dimensions of a photograph. So these were being done um, like in from 98 to about 2001, and that was sort of in the nascency of Photoshop. And up until then, a lot of photographs had always been presented in a kind of set ratio of like uh, 16 by 24 or 40 by 60 or a size that corresponded to the size of a negative. And because I was working in Photoshop, I was able to add on to things and crop and expand um, and create something that was more like a frieze or a mural so that you have to physically walk down the length of the photograph to have the narrative uh, unveiled. Um, so it's almost like a, a manual film strip in a way. Um, 
Then I began working on a series of photographs that kind of uh, played with the idea of these aquatic environments. Um, up until then, I had been building a lot of sets or shooting on location, um, and I wanted to kind of extract myself from the work. Um, but at that time, I was actually on a residency in New Zealand, um, and so I was trying to figure out how to do that, and this kind of felt like an intermediary step to me, where I got to play with the idea of these um, almost like void type of situations where the light would pass through the water and change the shape of things and bloat the figures. Um, but at the same time, I was very attracted to the landscape um, and was still kind of creating these interventions in the la landscape and photographing myself in those areas. And this actually is, is probably the last photograph in which I participated in as, um, I guess, a character within the scene, um, just because I realized that I was becoming more enamored with the environment and the interventions that I was creating. And after I had completed a shoot, I kind of would look around and realize that I was more interested in how chaotic and messy it looked, that the, in a way that was its own story. So I began to extract myself from the work completely. Um, so this is one of the first photos uh, in which I was exploring that process. This is a uh, cornfield. And basically I wanted to create a narrative without the presence of any humans, but where there was a, a strong leftover imprint. So you've kind of come across this scene in the aftermath. Um, this is molting. And if you look over on the right side, there are some deer behind the tree. And one of them has large antlers that are uh, shedding the felt. So the felt is kind of hanging off the antlers in a way that mimics the toilet paper hanging from the trees. Um, and within this body of work, there are often times wild animals that almost supplant or take over uh, the place of the, the characters within the uh, self-portrait series. So this is an example of that. Uh, this is Cherry Island, and it's this almost sicky sweet uber pastoral scene. Um, <clears throat> but it's probably a good image to uh, discuss a little bit the process behind um, how I was shooting up until this point and how I started shooting once I was uh, working with landscape. Um, prior to this, when I was doing the self-portraits, I would set up the camera on a tripod and try my hardest not to move the tripod. And then I would choreograph things so that I was enacting the roles of each person within the photograph. And afterwards, I would seam it together in post-production. Um, and at that time, I was shooting in negatives because digital cameras were so exorbitantly expensive, I couldn't afford them. And so I was shooting with a, a two and a quarter Roloflex and then scanning the negatives and working from that. So a lot of the photos were composed of, you know, anywhere between 20 and 50 photographs. Um, but then once I started working on these landscape pieces, uh, I had a digital camera. Uh, actually, I didn't, not at that point. But uh, I, I was shooting in a way where I was no longer tied to having a tripod. I, I was shooting um, things that I felt a gravitational pull towards or um, environments where I would take pieces of the environment and then uh, pull it all together to create almost a concentrated feeling of that space or um, kind of try to bring in the periphery. Um, and so shooting without the tripod or without this like fear of moving things because it would make it more difficult to put the image together in post-production kind of creates um, an interesting perspective. And you can see it in this image, particularly when you're looking at the actual photograph, <coughs> because when you're shooting, you have a two-point perspective. But when you're moving the camera, you continually are shifting that two-point perspective. So when you're looking at an image like this, you're not really grounded on the ground. You're not necessarily hovering above. And there are moments within the photograph that are seemingly more in focus than other moments. And so it almost is a, a subtle, nauseating way of directing the eye throughout the photograph. Um, and it's something that I've started to play with and you'll see in some of the later images. Um, 
So once I returned from New Zealand, I started to um, work with other people, but wasn't necessarily interested in, in portraiture. And again, kind of was more interested in how people work together in groups. So um, this is <clears throat> the beginning of a series that I did called the Sheltered Series, in which um, all of the locations have some sort of makeshift uh, habitation. So they could be, for instance, in this one, tree houses, um, lean-tos, forts, caves, that kind of thing. Um, and the figures are sort of relegated to the background. They're usually very small. They're often hooded or masked or turned away from the camera so that their identity is not necessarily a crucial part of the image. Um, I was also uh, beginning to work on large-scale drawings. Uh, these are drawings done on mylar, uh, which is kind of a semi-transparent paper that architects used. Um, it's similar to vellum, and I uh, was drawing and painting on both sides of it, so it kind of created a layered aspect to it. Um, and the drawings and the photographs kind of work in tandem, and a lot of the imagery from this body of work deals with the idea of, again, these makeshift shelters that kind of reference backyard playdates, but also uh, the idea of like refugee camps and detainment camps um, or outsider communities. And they also show people that are in transition or in this kind of um, migratory process. So this image is called Fleeing. Um, this is Campfire, and you can see some people sort of off in the distance in the trail and overhead are some large birds that are circling past. Um, this is another drawing, uh, deconstruction. This is lakeside. Uh, the figures in the tent, uh, again, are caught in an ambiguous gesture. It's um, not clear whether they're fighting with each other or making out. Um, and I sort of like uh, when a gesture can be that, uh, can be two things at once that are so uh, diametrically opposed. So again, like that image that I showed you from Blizzard where someone could simultaneously be in a protective embrace or be, you know, kind of trapped in a headlock. Um, a lot of these images are kind of staged in a way that uh, the earth is bisected so that you see the stratus of the earth and it creates a stage on which the activity is taking place um, as in this image which is called the ice storm and then in the foreground is a deer carcass covered in icicles and the, the people in the background are, are knitting um, blankets for the deer carcass. There's a couple of blankets in the foreground. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the defectors. This is Ghost Ship, um, and a lot of, actually this next drawing sort of illustrates this well. This is uh, Balseros, uh, in which these kids have put everything they own on a raft and are floating through glacial waters. Um, a lot of the images from this body of work sort of tap into the family mythology that I was fed growing up. Um, as I mentioned, my whole family is from Cuba, and so I often would hear stories about how they had to leave everything behind. And um, they came to America in 1961. Um, and so that has always left an imprint on me that um, things can be taken away and that nothing is really permanent. Um, and there's you know, this potential for having to uproot yourself and move somewhere else. And so a lot of this work is informed by that. Um, this is Dirge. This is Cave. Um, again, a, probably a good example of what I was talking about earlier with moving the, or shifting the camera around. Um, so it looks as if the moss-covered rocks are being shot from above. And then if you look up to the, to the bridge, that's kind of almost shot on eye level. It's like parallel with the camera but it's positioned in a, in a higher level. And the figures on the top are much smaller than the figures below, even though they're in the same plane. So the ability to like 
free myself up and um, try to not create such a realistic situation. It's more akin to the way that I draw and paint. Um, and so I kind of enjoyed um, at this time playing with those two medium going back and forth. So the drawing, um, because it was done on mylar and sort of layered and worked from the back and the front, operated in an almost analog version of what Photoshop is and how I was digitally constructing the images uh, and vice versa. Um, this is Still Life with Pig. Um, and again, uh, I was still very interested in shooting on location and building structures and um, synthesizing environments. So, for example, this is an area in the woods where I had gone on this trail and there was a burnt out car in one area and this shed like further down and um, the sort of rock wall behind it was shot somewhere else. So everything kind of gets shot in segments and then reconfigured once I take it back to the studio. This is still life with tea. Um, this is also in relation to a video that I shot as well. Um, I forgot to mention at the same time I was simultaneously doing a lot of video and kind of uh, fleshing out the idea of narration through time-based medium where that idea of multiplicity uh, and multitude gets configured in the progression of time. So for example, uh, one of the videos is somebody sitting in bed uh, at night and they're biting their nails, but they start obsessively biting their nails and they just keep regenerating. And the, it, by the end, the figure is like covered in nail shards and spit. And it's a two minute video, but um, it's pretty gruesome to watch. But you see this kind of progression of a very ordinary mundane thing that gets distorted with time. Um, this is Orchard. Again, this image and the following image both have that kind of bisected landscape with, that creates a stage for the activity. Um, this is a uh, dogfight, and you can see all the root structure within the dirt, and then these dogs scrambling up the tree to kind of get to this guy who's up there with a boulder in his hands. Um, this is, these are a couple of larger drawings. Um, just so you have a sense of scale, like this is about eight feet by 10 feet. Um, and I was sort of exploring, working with different mediums. This is called Petroleum Dream and below the gray area is actually all made with poppy seeds. Um, this is the arsonist sun. Um, I'll just sort of scroll through some of these. This is actually the beginning of a series that I did um, where I was kind of working with photography, drawing and painting, and video. Um, this is, these are photographs that relate to the video. Our film is a 30 minute film called The Septemberist in which uh, these characters are living almost in a commune on a farm and they each have individualized tasks and they go out and there's no dialogue. Everything is accompanied by music. So each group of, um, men or boys go out into the forest or the fields and they're accompanied by a different musical instrument. It's a bit like uh, uh, Prokiev's uh, Peter and the Wolf in that sense. And so they wake up in this compound, get dressed. Uh, some of them go out and harvest cotton uh, in this greenhouse. Um, others shear sheep. And um, it's about, it's sort of about this idea of the ritual and tradition for preparing uh, for a ritual or a tradition. Um, this is this morning scene, um, and it sort of it sort of relates to um, like the tin drum and the Pied Piper. There are all these rats under the bed, um, but basically they go out, they harvest wool, cotton, they spin it into fabric. Um, then they go into the forest at night into this pond with a 12-piece orchestra and they serenade the pond and then they wade into it and pull out um, these octopus that they take back to their farm. They dissect the octopus to get their ink sacs and dye the, the clothing, which is what they're doing here. 
Um, this is actually an image of them dissecting the octopus. Um, and then they make these clothes to enact a sort of um, hybridized wedding, funeral, baptism. So the, actually this earlier image is, is part of that ceremonial passage at the end. Um, so you can sort of see these are stills from the, the video of, of the different figures and their musical instruments. Um, and basically this film, I kind of, I worked on it uh, for several months over the summer and it was a culmination of everything that I had been doing up until that point, this idea of like this strong narrative structure, really lush uh, environments, like almost fairy tale type environments, um, dealing with the idea of uh, adolescence and uniformity. And by the end of it, I was just totally sick of everything that I was doing. It was like too much. And so um, I often have these knee jerk reactions to my own work and try to do something completely different just to reinvigorate myself. Um, and so this was sort of what spontaneously happened in the aftermath. Um, this is a part of a series of photographs that dealt more with uh, urban environments. They're depopulated. Um, the few figures that are existent in this body of work are, are much older. Um, I was really interested in um, sort of the, what I would think of as like a second puberty, like that period in time where you're not middle-aged, but you're not completely old. You're like in this in-between zone. Um, and so the, the figures in this, uh, in this group of photographs relate to that. There's also um, a lot of environmental context within the work. Um, and at this point, I really am constructing the photographs very much like I was how I work on drawing and painting, where I was just photographing random elements that I was attracted to, creating a large digital library of, of imagery, and then um, putting things together in my studio, reworking an image and building it uh, in the same way that I would build a painting. Uh, so for example, this image is partially from Vancouver, partially New Zealand. Um, the trolley lines are actually in Berlin. Um, so it really is like an amalgamation of different places. Um, this burnt out building uh, was actually in Miami. Um, there, it's a hotel that was being knocked down uh, to make way for a larger hotel. But um, I photographed it and then created this kind of lower level pit of iron railings, and then within each of the burnt out cavities, uh, I inserted hammocks with um, people lying uh, inside the hammocks. And again, they're all uh, older people uh, laying in the hammocks. And at the same time, I had done portraits of them and had decided to do drawings based on those portraits. Um, and up until this point, when I was, ever, when I was drawing or painting figures, I was never interested in representing them in a realistic manner. Uh, so I had always painted them blue or green and um, that didn't seem to make sense for this body of work. Um, it sort of made the figures look like witches. <laughs> so I uh, began to draw them in the negative um, and then realized that in drawing the negative, I could create my own photographs. So um, this image on the left is the drawing and then I would make a unique mirror image photograph from the drawn negative. Um, so these are portraits um, all generated from the people that I was working with at the time. And I liked this process and uh, had never really dealt so directly with the idea of portraiture before, so I wanted to apply it to something that made a little bit more sense contextually for me. And so I began uh, working with an archive of family photos that I, I had of family members from Cuba. So uh, this is an image of my mother's first communion. Um, this is my grandfather. And a lot of these are images that I grew up with and they're sort of studio style shots that uh, hung in the hallway of our house. And some of the people in the photographs I had always grown up and not necessarily known who they were. Others had, again, these sort of like mythical tales behind them. And so 
drawing them um, sort of allowed me to reclaim them. I think because they had always had this like really beautiful black and white uh, studio lit uh, Hollywood portrait style to them, I always had wished that I had taken them somehow. And so being able to draw them in the negative and then use that drawing to remake the photograph sort of allowed me to do that, but it also um, created a generational remove or it mimicked the process of the actual generational remove from a place. Um, so I was then taking these drawings and inserting them in places where I had lived in either in the south or where I live now in the north um, and re-photographing them almost as missing persons uh, posters or propagandistic kind of uh, advertisements. Um, and about the time that I was doing this, was, I was living in New York and it was after 9-11 and there were many kind of missing persons to notice around New York uh, pinned up in a similar way. And it was something that felt very like poignant to me. And so um, it kind of ended up seeping into my work in this way. Um, also, the idea of the telephone pole kind of became prevalent within this body of work just because uh, there's the literal idea of communication um, and this idea that telephone poles uh, have traditionally been places where people post notices, but then also they have this almost crucifix type of form. And a lot of the stories that uh, my parents and grandparents had told me kind of have this martyrdom element to them, and so it seems uh, fitting um, that they be presented in this way. Um, and again, it sort of let, lent this further uh, generational remove, almost like a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox, in the sense that the original photograph I had taken, drawn in the negative, used that to make a photograph, then took that photograph, hung it somewhere, and re-photograph it. But the exception to that is that none of these actually exist there. Um, I sort of put them in these environments digitally to kind of create an idealized version of the scenario um, because many of the stories that I had been told were very much idealized and exaggerated and so I kind of wanted to mimic that in the process. So it's not necessarily necessarily a, a, a needed uh, information but I, just thought it was an interesting backstory. Um, I also began using older photographs to create these hybridized family portraits. Um, so this is a drawing of uh, four generations of my family from both my mother and my father's side in a kind of imagined space of what their home, what I thought their home would look like. Um, this is another version of that at a large banquet table. Again, uh, this image is called Last Supper. Uh, and in the foreground, the empty chairs allude to future generations. But uh, basically, this gathering of people were not necessarily all alive at the same time, and they didn't necessarily know each other at the same time. So um, it's a very uh, kind of artificial reimagining of a situation. Um, so this is the drawing of Last Supper, and then this is the photograph generated from that drawing. And they hang side by side as a diptych, and the combination of the two is about 16 feet uh, long. Um, and then once I visited Cuba, um, I began photographing all of my relatives' homes and schools um, and places that they had you know, provided me a list to go and visit. Um, and while I was there, I kind of felt almost like an archaeologist, you know, hunting down all these sites. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do with all of the imagery. Um, and when I got home, um, one of the things that I was struggling with was the fact that everything was so bright. And I realized that so much of what I had grown up knowing about Cuba, I learned and gleaned from stories and from old black and white photographs. So I made everything black and white or desaturated it. Um, and I also began painting directly on top of the photographs. So these are salt water fed pools. One of them is um, my grandfather's, it was behind his house. I just couldn't necessarily locate 
his. So I took a picture of all of them and put them together and then painted a sort of reimagined version of what they must have looked like when they were pristine um, directly on top of the photograph. And the same is true here. This is the art school in Havana, which um, is sort of in disrepair and you're not necessarily allowed to photograph it. Um, I went in or snuck in and um, photographed it. And it's amazing. It's a beautiful modernist structure that was built as a monument to the revolution. Um, and it was built on an old country club estate that where the land was confiscated and, and given back to the state. But unfortunately, that country club estate used to be marshland. And so this amazing structure, the foundations have all started to crumble and it's in, in disrepair. But uh, consequently, it looks like this amazing uh, lost city of the future. And so it, it's connected by all these uh, half underground tunnels. Um, and so I kind of composited those in the foreground. And then in the background, you can see these amphitheater style classrooms. And I painted out all of the daylight. Uh, the image is called Day for Night and created this constellation in the background, but it's not actually an uh, astrological constellation. It's charting the migratory path of hurricanes between the United States and Cuba, and again, referencing that idea of migration. Um, this is an installation shot in the gallery where I created these half-size telephone poles that almost mimic the Stations of the Cross. Um, and then you can sort of see in the background um, the photographs of other telephone poles with the images hung on them. It creates kind of a longer processionary arrangement. Um, this is a sculpture where cinder blocks are cast out of crystal leaded glass and then drawings are inserted into hand-blown glass bottles that are all one piece. So the drawings are permanently inside and um, the cinder blocks also are something that uh, kind of found their way into my work and got added as, as part of my vocabulary simply because so many of the buildings in Havana are in such disrepair that you see those cinder blocks, uh, cinder blocks um, as part of the foundation or as buildings are crumbling. And in my mind, they sort of revealed themselves almost as units of, of sculpture. And so I began working with them as well. So um, this piece is called uh, Seawall, and it references the Malacón, which is the seawall in Havana. Um, and so the, the portraits inside are all family members um, that had lived in Havana uh, before I was born. Uh, this is almost a negative version of that same installation in which it bisects the floor plan of my uh, mother and grandmother's house. Um, and when I was in Havana, I was lucky enough to be admitted into their house. It actually was a bureau for tourism and they gave me the floor plans. And so I was able to reconstruct a scale model of their house, which uh, I think you'll see in a little bit. Um, these are also uh, two vitrines that I had made of my maternal and paternal grandmother. Uh, and they're sort of laid out as if it was a reliquary. Their uh, limbs are drawn in a x-ray kind of form where you can see through to their bones. And then you can also see in their pelvic area almost a sonogram shape of my mother and my father. So again, alluding to uh, future generations. But it sort of felt, um, apropos of the way that I had experienced Cuba the first time I had visited, because again, I felt almost like an archeologist digging up um, past archives. Um, this is the reconstruction of my mother and grandmother's house, which looks nothing like what I thought it would look like. It was actually very modernist. Um, so I was surprised to see it. And um, the, the video is actually part of this piece. It, the house houses the, the projector. And it's a video of, of me in a boat at night. The boat's filled with cinder blocks. And so it, when the video starts, uh, the boat's really low in the water. And I jettison the blocks. And as they go over, you sort of hear the soundtrack of bombs and missile raids 
or missile sirens, and it um, alludes to the idea of the Bay of Pigs, but also kind of was almost a literal interpretation of wanting to bring this house back with me. I had such a strong reaction to seeing it um, and just had this fantasy of being able to bring it back brick by brick. Um, so that's kind of part of, of that piece. Um, and I'm just going to quickly scroll through some other work. Um, I had become interested in the idea of installation and sculpture while working on a lot of the family Cuba work. Um, so these are some hybridized sculptures in which I was kind of playing with the idea of 2D and 3D materials and painting and sculpture. Um, this piece is actually part of a video. Um, it's a life-size pinata, um, and the video is of an identical pinata being eviscerated by um, identical figures that are, are bashing it. Um, and uh, the video camera kind of creates almost a live feed of that and streams to the video in the next room. Um, this piece is called Chorus, um, and it's constructed of 16 drawings of figures in mourning placed on music stands. So the music stands are almost human height. And then there's a sound element to it, uh, which is Mozart's Mass Requiem, um, and it's slowed down one time for each of the portraits. So it ends up sounding like a almost Gregarian chant uh, or this low hum. And all of the portraits have this kind of uh, cloth or drapery in front of them. And so the idea of expressing their portrait through their gesture as opposed to their face. Um, and that kind of drapery crops up uh, a lot in the imagery uh, and photographs and paintings as well, just as this idea of trying to cloak something um, or reveal something. So um, you see it here in some of these photos that I constructed that are almost like um, temporary monuments in a way. Um, in fact, this one's actually called Monument. Um, this is driftwood. It's a bunch of porcelain china sort of lining this uh, piece of driftwood, uh, like barnacles. Um, these are a series of parachutes in which I composited them together and then uh, painted the parachute lines directly on top of the photograph, sort of resembling this idea of like a airborne jellyfish. Um, this is stained glass forest. Um, and as you can see, that idea of things in bulk and multiplicity are still prevalent in this work as well. Um, and you'll, you'll see uh, paintings that kind of resemble this too. Um, this is temporary. It's kind of a makeshift sculpture that I made in the middle of this, these abandoned stables. And then I recreated the roof structure of the photograph. Um, this is a larger painting um, called Automotive Drawing in the Dark, and basically it's a, a drawing in the snow with tire treads, using the, a car to physically make the, the drawing, but it's a painting of that idea. So, um, And some of these larger landscape paintings um, kind of, again, are a mixture of where I grew up and where I live now. So. Um, this one is called Feral, and it's a cotton field in a birch forest, which um, I don't know, anachronistic is not the right word, but they're sort of uh, incongruous uh, gestures um, because that wouldn't naturally happen that way. Um, same with this one. This is Spanish moss. Um, and a lot of these paintings kind of hover between dusk and dawn. And so again, they take place during a transitional period from one state to another. And there's something about that kind of light that shifts things and makes objects appear differently than what they really are, which is something that's always fascinated me. Um, this also, again, you see that idea of bisecting um, the, the foreground to create almost a stage. And you can sort of see here how I'm painting from the backside and it creates that almost foggy atmospheric look to it. Um, this 
in my mind, it's almost reminiscent of the photograph that I showed you earlier of the stained glass forest um, with all of this fog. Uh, this is sodium street lights or sodium sulfur street lights. All the wires are tangled within this tree. Um, this is hot house, salt shed. I'm just going to sort of go through the rest of these really quickly. These are um, painting sculptures. I made a rock garden in which I inserted uh, paintings into these larger rocks. Um, the paintings are of trees supported by scaffolding, and then you can see on the back side of the paintings this almost stage-like scaffolding. And I've always been interested in that idea of, of showing these um, stage-like tableaus. Um, this is a painting of a video still. Um, it's actually called Portrait of a Video Still. And it's a painting of a makeshift video screen in a forest. And the subtitles that are painted on it are the last lines from um, the movie The Misfits. And The Misfits, uh, the landscape is a very strong character within the movie. So it becomes this kind of self-referential um, painting. Um, Again, uh, playing with that hybridization, these are painted video stills where um, the figure's features are projected on top of themselves. And it's difficult to tell in slide format, but part of the painting is this black letterboxed format um, on the top and bottom. Um, and so that sort of has led me to um, play with the idea of portraiture and um, kind of, again, amassing the idea of uh, what's thought of as traditionally beautiful and taking multiple uh, features that are beautiful and putting them all together into one figure um, to create somewhat of a Frankenstein grotesquerie. Um, so these are other sort of large scale portraits. They're about six feet by eight feet, I guess. Um, and these are a series of anonymous self-portraits. They kind of harken back to earlier photo-based works in which the figures, um, they're not actually self-portraits and the figures are kind of hidden by this blocked out architectural shape of their clothing. Um, and you can never really get a full glimpse of their face. So the, the portrait is again, more of a performative gesture and they're kind of caught in this transitional um, space where it's not clear if they're revealing or unveiling, uh, unveiling something. Um, and then the last few slides are just a series of sculptures, uh, again, where I'm kind of playing with two-dimensional, three-dimensional structures. I uh, have been casting um, these almost sandbag, pillow-like structures and plaster, and then uh, embedding drawings in uh, acrylic resin um, and situating them onto these uh, plaster structures. So for instance, um, this was part of an installation that I did in Berlin for a show about um, adolescent refugees and the figures are, are in a state of repose and are hovered or straddled across these plaster pillows, um, but they also kind of uh, look like sarcophagi or body bags or um, kind of sculptural friezes. Um, but they also reference this idea of a refugee camp and the kind of cots and, and that sort of sleeping arrangement. Um, these, again, dealing with these uh, kind of boulders and portraiture um, that's uh, blocked out or obfuscated. These are portraits that I amassed um, between uh, the 1930s and late 60s of people who were arrested for being gay, lesbian, or bisexual. They were labeled as sexual deviants. And um, I reworked their um, mug shots and presented them in this kind of grainy infrared uh, way and then inserted them into rocks, almost like an epitaph. Um, and this strongly relates to, um, oh, why is it not showing up? Hmm. All of a sudden, the slides disappeared. But it was my last slide, which was this image of uh, the memorial that I did. Um, 
Oh, there. Um, so the memorial that I did is the LGBT memorial. It's in uh, New York, um, in Greenwich Village. Um, and these are large uh, boulders that are cast in bronze. And then they're split. And the, the split is filled with uh, faceted glass that when the sun hits it, it kind of refracts and creates a prismatic color spectrum. Um, and they range in size, but the largest one is a little over six feet tall. And instead of having glass in between, it has an inward facing quote on each side from Audre Lorde um, about the idea of, of community and how a community is made up of difference. Um, so these are just a couple of shots of the memorial in situ, and it kind of creates like this circular harbor um, in the park, and you're encouraged to sit on them and uh, interact with them. Um, but that's basically it, especially because uh, the slides keep disappearing. But that that was the next and the last one, anyway. So, um, but yeah, thank you. I don't know if you have any questions. I realize I've been talking for quite a while. So. <laughs>